I ain't mad at you. How did that video come about? I ain't mad at you is, is a video I think that Tupac and I are most connected on. Um, he was very clear of the concept he wanted. He was very clear. We were both clear about the non-judgmental nature of God, meaning we don't know who's in heaven. So we took great, um, not consideration, but consideration, if you will, on who might be in heaven. Who would think the Red Fox would welcome in into heaven? We don't know. But why not go for it? Red Fox, uh, Miles Davis, Dunny Hathaway, Minnie Ripperton, Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, Marvin Gaye. I think, let's say Billy Holiday. Yeah, that was pretty much who we wanted to be in heaven. And it was, you know, we had a great time casting, great time the wardrobe. The one story that comes to mind most is the gentleman who played Miles Davis hadn't really, he had never seen Miles Davis. He had, didn't even know who he was, but from a casting standpoint, he was told that he looked like Miles Davis. So I sent him home with a Miles Davis uh, DVD from Paris so he can learn, you know, how Miles Davis, you know, performed if you will. And he came out and did it perfectly. Oh, yeah, and Sam Davis Jr. is also in heaven also. It was fun going through, you know, the authenticity of the lookalikes. You know, I'll make sure that the Donny Hathaway, you know, looked like had the apple hat and that Sammy Davis Jr. character had the glasses and the rings and Billy Holiday person had the flower in the hair. Uh, Jan Gay, dear friend of mine, lent me some of Marvin Gaye's clothes. That video, for me, was, was the most fun. Not to mention working with Bokeem uh, Woodbine, who's the ultimate professional. How was it working with him? He was, he was great. He was, even to this day, if I see him out in, in public 25 years later, we lock on that and talk about it. He was great, great to work with. He came prepared. He's pumped up. He was in character. It wasn't just a music video for him. It was actually an acting gig for him. What was the full concept behind that music video? I mean, you saw it. I mean, a guy who came out from a party, um, basically he got shot and his best friend, you know, uh, was there to care for him. And so the best friend, in honor, you know, to um, his dead friend's family, wanted to do the right thing and take care and bring flowers, you know, to, to his wife and so on and so forth. It's really, in a sense, in a weird sense, art imitating life. Right, right. It was a little eerie seeing Tupac in that BMW in that video, knowing that Tupac ended up getting shot in a BMW in Vegas. Yeah, I mean, that was just a coincidence. No one, I was asked about that from a magazine publisher, and it was just a coincidence. We never talked about, you know, I'm going, I'm going to die in a black BMW or whatever. Purely coincidence. There was no eerie, you know, premonition as far as I knew. Right, right. But um, if I'm not mistaken, that video released like a week after Tupac death, right? Maybe a week, I believe. But we probably we shot that maybe a full month before he passed away. Just you know, I think that was the first single off of uh, Machiavelli, I believe. Right, but um, if I'm not mistaken, y'all had somebody playing Jimi Hendrix in that video, right? I don't think we had Jimi Hendrix in that video. I don't. You know what? Again, twenty-five years later, I, I would. I have to look at it and see because I would, you know, think I have the headband and the guitar and the shoes and all that. That's not. A, that doesn't sound familiar to me. But again, I've seen that video in so long. I have to study it. Right, right. So, to live and die in L.A. How did that video come about? That one was another let's shoot tomorrow situation. And uh, actually, Shook gave me a call and said, I want to do a video around L.A. with somebody who knows L.A. I'm like, well, fine, that's, that's me. And really, for the most part, with the exception of Compton, the Centennial sign, all that, that is really the L.A. that I grew up in. The Fat Burgers on San Vicente, the Roscoe's on Gower, um, you know, eating in front of, you know, the Crenshaw Mall, the Broadway sign, the background, the Louisiana Fried Chicken, all those things um, were part of my LA, Inglewood sign, Randy's Donuts, um, you know, the Muslim Brothers selling bean pies on the liquor bank on Crenshaw. 
I, I save that video now because that really is a time capsule. Time capsule. A lot of that LA doesn't exist right now, particularly the liquor bank and the mall. I think the stock and swap meet has a different name now. I think too. So even I have pictures from you know the LA riots I took in that video. That's really a personal video for me. Yeah, man, that was such a dope video, man. Who idea was it to have Tupac walking around the mall and Tupac having a full fight? That was all impromptu. That was, you know, going in the mall was easy. I mean, actually, I was our home base in the parking lot. Just walked through the mall because that is L.A. And the food fight, that happened totally like, you know, that was as impromptu as they come. I kind of felt disres disrespected Roscoe's, but, hey, we had a good time. So none of that wasn't planned. Tupac holding the babies, Tupac having fun with the kids. None of that wasn't planned at all. Oh yeah, that's it. at City Hall. That was all as it happened. Nothing, nothing was rehearsed with Tupac. Nothing at all. You also did the House of Blues, right? How did that come about? I mean, you know, another one of those let's do a tomorrow project. So fortunately, in LA, you can shoot tomorrow. And uh, I think Pocket just flew in from Milan, and it was actually an afternoon show. And I believe Andre Farr, my good friend Andre Farr, had that night as a promoter. And uh, we had a good time with that. It was, it was, uh, what can I say? It was, it was Death Row took over the House of Blues. Everybody had a good time. It wasn't more than a three hour shoot. And at this point, I believe that is Tupac's last recorded performance. So at this point, it's historical. Right, right. How was it that night, man? I know it had to be crazy, man. It seemed like it was a crazy atmosphere. You know, I'm going to tell you again, it wasn't crazy at all. I've done a lot of shows in hip-hop, and that was, it was, first of all, like I said, it was an afternoon, so it was very, very chilled. It was a free show, so it, it was no issues. I mean, I wish I could tell you it was crazy, but it wasn't. you got to figure, we're dealing professionals. We're dealing with people like Snoop and uh, DJ Pooh and uh, Dog Pound. This wasn't the first time we've done shows. This is just another show. And, you know, I guess it was like maybe a three hour afternoon with, I think, four acts. Yeah. How was it like seeing Tupac perform? I mean, you know, for me, it's work. I mean, I've seen, you know, Tupac perform. I've seen Run DMC. I've seen 50, Eminem, uh, Dre, Snoop, uh, Wu Tang. Uh, Public Enemy, Biggie, Puffy. I mean, for me, it's, I, I put it all in kind of the same category. It's work. I've been fortunate to have been a lot, uh, done a lot of shows in hip hop, my shows, period. And I just shot Tyler the Creator a couple weeks ago. It's a show. Right, right. And you said that Tupac came from Italy to do his House of Blues performance? Yeah, he just got it from Italy, so he was kind of tired, but he, he got through it. Right, right. But um, out of curiosity, did Tupac ever go into more detail with you about his trip to Italy? It's, it's funny you should ask that. That's the one thing that we talked about the most. He loved Italy. He really, really loved Italy. That's the one thing that we had sidebars on all the time. How much fun Italy is, how beautiful it is, and the art, architecture, food, clothes. I think he showed, for, at least for me, his renaissance man, you know, side dealing with, you know, his travels. But other than that, we didn't have much more to talk about.